Hi guys, today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. Tis that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. <laughs> is that a Russian thing? <laughs> <laughs> It's that easy. Yeah. That was Italian. What it am I doing? Italiano. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whiskey and the pierogies. I'm going to throw a huge special thanks to all our patrons on Patreon, which the current list is just go ahead. Um, Stephanie L. Uh, Terry Needleman. Uh, Max Lunig. Benjamin Lehrer. Chris O'Kelly. Lily Ackles. Ackles. Danielle Renix. Mackenzie Horner. And Taryn the Duck. Who is an actual duck. <laughs> It might be an actual duck. We haven't we haven't we haven't checked up on that. Taryn, tell us if you're an actual duck. Um, they give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you would like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks such as patron only commentaries, our episodes a day early, and even some free um likes they're getting some surveys to figure out what we're covering next. So they're getting a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and the commentaries are fantastic, if I do say so myself. The, uh, yeah, they're the a lot of fun. The one where we just shit on Matthew Broderick for an hour and a half is uh, top-tier content. Yep, and the <laughs> one where we're just confused by cats is also great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you you want to do the link this time, Jess? Yeah, we have an affiliate link. Click it, buy stuff on Amazon, and we get money. All right, let's start the show. Ooh. Hooray! Isn't it amazing how he just he turns that on like that? He just has that shill voice. Yeah. Like... <laughs> I get it. Two sides to man. Let's see, he's gonna... got... He literally... I have a video chat. He flips his head around. Oh my god. Oh, he does like a Jekyll and Hyde type scenario. <laughs> yeah, like he, his, the back of his head is like an advertising uh, executive. <laughs> oh my god. You just flip your hair back and forth as you go from one to the other. It's this crazy. is not a dream, my friend. Audible <laughs> is on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. And today, we have a very, very, very special guest. Oh my goodness, the guest, the specialness of this guest is like through the, through the roof. Uncontainable. Through the roof. Um, we have Hugo-nominated writer, editor, and creator Angelina Meehan of um, many things, but most... Notably, the Lindsay Ellis's content on YouTube, correct? Yeah, yes, that is that is absolutely correct. I once was an altar server. That was a notable thing. Uh, and um, yeah, no, but yeah, that that's uh, pretty much uh, not pretty much, but like where the the bulk of my creative output is right now. <laughs> and didn't someone like credit you as like like Delaware teen or something? <laughs> yeah, Lindsay was in. Um, they were doing like a retrospective on her career for Wired dot com, and they wanted to talk to me to get some perspective as her co writer and co editor. And I. I told them about how we met on fanfiction.net as teenagers and that I was from Delaware originally and that ended up translating to a fellow teen and Delaware fanfiction scribe. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, if you've got to have something on your grave, that's a good way One to One of your most famous roles, Delaware teen. Delaware teen, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's not loving mother, kind wife, you know, someone who changed the world. I was a Delaware teen. <laughs> Which, if you are from Delaware, oh, <laughs> says a lot. It's a tough life. It's a hard life. Yeah, <laughs> and Delaware wears you down. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's that's I guess what I'm, I'm most notable for right now. Um, I also do improv around Philadelphia. Uh, I don't. I do musical improv in particular, but. Um, oh yeah. wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's like a. I'm sorry, I'm making this about my work. Uh, no, if, if there's like a section to plug later, I can plug that, but I do musical improv in Philadelphia. Um, Jeez, it, this person is so full of themselves. I no, just, no. <laughs> <laughs> she is wonderful. Look, and I'm just she's a Biblio energy, okay? Like, that's, that's all I got. Very true, very true. Yeah. So, Angelina, you yeah. chose what we were covering today, so I'm going to let you introduce it. What are we talking about today? We are talking about the incredible, no rhymes in it whatsoever, my favorite show of the last decade and maybe ever, uh, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. Everyone's got nine different names, so look it up in your program. 
Natasha Pierre and the Grey Comet of 1812 is a sung-through musical adaptation of a 70-page segment of from Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, written by composer and lyricist Dave Malloy and directed by the incredible Tony-winning Rachel Chavkin. Not for this show, though. Well. It's based on Volume 2, <laughs> Part 5 of Tolstoy's novel War and Peace, focusing on Natasha's affair with Anatole and Pierre's search for meaning in his life. Um, it, de- it was developed in the Ars Nova Theater in 2012, followed by a 2013 stagings in both the Meatpacking District and the Theater District of Manhattan. Um, it premiered on Broadway in November at 2016 at the Imperial Theater and subsequently closed in September of 2017 after winning not that many Tonys. So, <laughs> yes, and we'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> so what did you guys both think of Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812? I'm going to start with Andrew, because I think we got a little sneak peek at what Angelina <laughs> thought. <laughs> but Andrew, you just got, you just watched this for the first time. Oh, yes. Um, and I would highly recommend seeing it live if possible. I, mean, I don't know if that's possible anymore. Um, it's, playing, it's playing in Japan, so if you're in Japan... Yeah. If you're in it. Japan, go and see that. Because uh, trying to watch this with no uh, idea what is happening is was a nightmare for me. I had to listen to the cast recording about nine times while reading the Wikipedia articles to figure out what the hell was going on. <laughs> uh, Music-wise, though, it's fantastic. Uh, all the music is very creative, and there's a lot of different styles, which I really liked. Um, and I don't think there was any song that I didn't like, and there was a couple songs that I really, really enjoyed. Um, so. I think it's good, but holy hell was I confused. <laughs> um, I, I absolutely adore uh, The Great Comet of 1812. Um, I, to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm just like five beers away from getting a Great Comet tattoo at any given point. Um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite shows that I've seen. It was kind of one of those things that rekindled my love in theater after kind of I'm being on a musical theater dry spell for a while. And um, I, I think about it. I listen to it like every uh, yeah at least once a week (laughs) this love has not died um but yeah um i i I don't know if this is the time to talk about it but like i had read war and peace when i was in college that's not a humble brag i literally had no friends in college so i was just kind of hanging out by myself figured i'd read war and peace and i had that context it's a very long book it's super long book it's a bit Um, long isn't it but uh (laughs) i I had that context kind of going into the show but didn't know anything else about it besides like josh groban was in it uh when i saw it so (laughs) and i have have a longer story about my first time seeing it but uh, i I, I can talk about that now or (laughs) let me get my thoughts and then we'll talk about how we first were introduced to this show except for andrew Except for me, because we all know how I was introduced. Jess sent me a link and forced me to watch it. <laughs> That's the premise of the show. Listen to the recordings. Don't watch the don't watch the YouTube version. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's no secret that I love this show, considering like more than one of our guests has been like actors and performers and behind the scenes folk from this show. Um, it is obviously one of the most advantageous Broadway shows, at least within the last 20 years. Uh, there's to. nothing that I can compare it to. Um, not even within Dave Malloy's own work is there anything this advantageous. Honestly, I discovered it very early on, I think all the way back when they released the first album, just mm-hmm. because I troll through musical cast recordings and whenever there's a new one, I download it immediately. Yeah. Um, and I didn't understand it the first four times I listened to it, much like <laughs> everyone else in the world. Um, and then, but I was just drawn in, especially by that opening number. Like, like by the end of that first song, you are sold on that show. Yeah, it, it really hits you in the ass. It's just like, oh, I, yeah. So like, uh, like when um, I, was like when I first found it. <laughs> uh, yes. I, yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Awkward segue. Um, so I. <laughs> I had first found heard this show. I had heard of it like when I was doing its Ars Nova run, like just really, really offhand kind of knowledge. And I was like, oh, we're in Peace Musical. That's fun. And um, I remember it was 2017. And um, so very sad note, but like I, my, my dad passed away when I was younger. So for Father's Day, I always usually kind of do something for myself. And 2017, June, I was going to New York. I was determined to see a Broadway show. Dear Evan Hansen had just won the Tony. And I could not get tickets to that. And I knew Great Comet was there, had kind of wanted to see it, bought a ticket just solely based on that. I remember putting my like butt in that seat, my ass cheeks like pancaked. The show started and I was like hooked within the thirst, like 
minute of it. I was like, this is it. I, I think I found my new favorite show. New favorite show. <laughs> That's surprising that you didn't know about it before the Tonys. I mean, I had heard of it. Like, I'd seen Hamilton back in November, and they were doing, um, like, a, a fundraising for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS competition between that and Great Comet. And so, like, I knew, like, about Great Comet. I knew what it was, and it was, like, with Josh Groban. But I was kind of, I guess I should preface by that first story by saying I had gone through, like, a really bad, kind of, like, low personal point in my life. And right as I was getting out of it was when I saw Great Comet. So I have a very, very strong affinity for it. Um, in that sense. I mean, I'm very happy to joke and laugh about it, but it does have a very, like, very huge emotional pull for me. Especially with, like, the theme of it. Um, and about Pierre, like, kind of being able to look at this comet and find and feel joy, you know? <laughs> I was like, ah, <laughs> oh, shit. I was sitting in the theater like, ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, shit. As like, I got the feels. But, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I find that really, like, incredible. And I'm insanely jealous that you got to see this live, not just once, but multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, like, the, the show where I saw it, and I saw it with the original Broadway cast. Um, immediately got on my bus back to Philadelphia and was like, I need to buy tickets for this again. I have a feeling this will probably close because nothing I like ever runs for very long. Um, I'm buying tickets for this again immediately. And, you know, my husband who puts up with my uh, whims was like, yeah, I'll go and see it again with you. And um, I ended up seeing it three times in total <laughs> before it closed in a very short amount of time. And I'm not paid money. I'll just leave it at that. Now, let's go into the plot of what actually the show is about, because it isn't the entirety of War and Peace, no. <laughs> but it still is equally as confusing and as character loaded as War and Peace. So just for comedy's sake, I'm going to force Andrew to tell me what the plot of this musical Good is. Fucking God. OK, I would like to say that I think I understand the plot now. <laughs> okay. It took a lot of times, but I think I get it. Do I have to go through every character? Because there's no way I'm going to remember them. Give all. me the broad okay, strokes. Like, the show can go through every character. <laughs> Yeah, the show goes through every character really fast, but I don't. I'm not able to sing it that quickly. <laughs> Pierre is like a depressed guy in Russia in, uh, well, 1812, I would assume. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's also Natasha, who is a um, person who's a uh, trying to marry a prince. I believe he's a prince. Mm -hmm. Andre, uh, Prince Andre. Andre? Yes, and I believe that's a prince. And, and he she... isn't here. Yes, he's off at war, and he is also friends with Pierre. Fun fact, in the book, he is not off at war. He is just kind of hiding. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> why? But okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and then Natasha meets someone named Anatole and cheats on Andre, kind of. There's yeah. like an affair of some sort. And in the and then Pierre like kicks Anatole out of town and yeah and and then the the end of it I think but there's like a bunch of other stuff in the middle but that's like how it ends. <laughs> Notice how Natasha and Pierre do not meet until that final scene. They do not have a single interaction until the very end of the show. Yes, although that doesn't help with how confusing the show is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> it's like uh, when you that that line from The Simpsons where it's like, when are they going to get to the fireworks factory? Uh, when, are <laughs> when are they, they going to see the comet? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of audience participation elements added to the show, which makes it feel like the best part of theater. Angelina, I want you to kind of describe to me what kind of elements they did, because they gave out food and a bunch of other stuff. So just walk yeah. me through that. About um, pierogies and little um, like rhythmic shakers that were shaped like eggs. I think when they were originally doing it in the meat pack ugh, packing district, they gave out vodka, which for very obvious reasons they couldn't do at the Imperial Theater. Um, and the way that they should have. They should have. Oh, man. Well, like, I think actually what it was now like they give out like or they gave out in the broadway one um plastic shot glasses of water that were supposed to look like vodka um but was regretfully not vodka Yuck. um that's lame <laughs> that's really lame uh but uh yeah and then then of course the way the show is staged the, the whole theater is essentially the stage so you'd have cast members like 
talking to you, handing you like letters or not talking to you, but like looking you in the eye. Um, when I saw it the second time, I was sitting front row mezzanine and there's a lot of action that happens in front row mezzanine. And like at one point I had a sweaty Josh Groban, you know, one foot away from me, like just shaking his uh, fat suit in my face. And it was just like, it was one of those like surreal moments that you were like, I God, am. God, I wish that were me. <laughs> Well, the best part of it was, was like, obviously, <laughs> he brought in a lot of non-Broadway uh, people. He brought in a lot of, like, Josh Groban moms as well, I'll call them. And, uh, oh, my God. Like, there's this, uh, so part of the stage is in front of one of the the, the um, balcony seats. And uh, there's this one moment um, where he's standing and singing in front of this one woman in one of the balconies, or boxes, rather, I should say. And uh, this one was clearly there for Josh Groban. And, like, his butt's, like, eye level with her. And the spotlight's also on her because he's standing right there and she's staring and like in her zone man and like it totally took everyone out of the off like audience with them like everyone was just like look at this woman just thirsting real hard for josh groban (laughs) horn and hard for the josh grobes i doubt anyone did that for dave malloy when he hopped into the role oh you go on tumblr you'd be surprised Uh, that's fair <laughs> it's not the same. There's not that mainstream appeal. Yeah, it's not you raise no. me up ass in my face. Oh man. <laughs> you you raise me up, my sure. ass. <laughs> <laughs> but also the audience becomes a character in a way like it like they grab some c- people from the audience and make them characters in the story. Yeah, like there's this wonderful great scene between Natasha and her would-be sister-in-law where they're kind of having this awkward meeting with each other and it's right in the middle of uh, one of the onstage uh, seats. And then, like, Anatole flirts with people in the audience, and it's always super fun. It was, it, yeah, it was just kind of different every, you know, show kind of thing. Um, All I could think so, of was with the um, with those seats is how much did they pay for those seats? Oh the God. same as every other seat. Um, they're not Really? They're not crazy expensive. No, some, really? some of them were, but, like, there were, like, a couple of seats that are just, like, like, it was... I was looking at the seating chart later, and there was, like, one that was, like, $300 when I seen it. And, I, oh, of course, it was probably a resale ticket, too. But, like, it was, like, right where, like, dust and ashes happens. And I was like, oh, I want to be that person. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they were, like, they were like $70 seats at the bar. But you also can't see shit at the bar. Like, that bar that was, like, running off the proscenium. Uh, as I discovered, you can't really see much there. So, you know. It, Look with really- your ears, not your eyes. It has the most confusing seating chart I've ever looked at. Like, I'm like, I don't know where to sit. Yeah, you're like, what's above? Don't worry, Jess, you didn't have to. I know. (laughs) It was the saddest thing I never got to do. Can we now talk about the reason why Jess never got to sit on that stage and see that show? All right. Here here we go. Oh, here's the juicy drama. I don't know the drama. You're going to have to... Okay. So let's just start with the Tony Awards, because that's basically where the tea spilled and then spilled onto some electric plugs that started a fire. Yeah. Okay, so everyone was expecting this show to do well at the Tonys. It was nominated for 14 Tonys, which was a crazy amount. Like, I think that was tied for some high award. So everyone thought, oh, this is going to sweep or at least do very well. It decidedly did not, and everything more or less went to um, Dear Evan Hansen, um, sadly. Which I'm not a fan of, and I have a lot of problematic issues with, of course. Mistake, mistake. (laughs) (laughs) But you can tell, like, by the time Great Comet performs, they are very aware that this is not going to be their night. And, like, they just kind of perform the hell out of what they do. And Josh Groban goes out and hugs Dave Malloy and brings him onto the stage with them. It's... Super emotional, super cathartic to watch, but also heartbreaking. And they basically knew that unless they get some star quality into that show, their days are numbered. So they do that. They bring in Ingrid Michaelson to play Sonia. They um, get a lot of celebrity credence in there. Um, and then they bring in um, Oki Wright. Ona Doan, please tell me if yeah. I said that wrong. Yeah, um, I just he played, he they call him Oak, basically. Um, but he played he's famous for playing um Hercules Mulligan and James Madison in Hamilton. And he was supposed to start the role of Pierre on July eleventh. Um, and he was gonna do well. His performance was well received. I've 
saw bootlegs of it. He was absolutely incredible. He's a great Pierre, but he is not like the most bankable star in the world, especially compared to, say, Josh Groban. So the on July 26, 2017, they announced that famous actor Mandy Patinkin is going to step in for Pierre cutting Oak's um, Broadway run three weeks early. They did not alert Oak to this before the announcement went out. And he was like, that's a dick move. And Twitter was like, that's a real big dick move when you're kicking an African-American actor out of this role to replace him with a white guy. And with this, they started a campaign that was hashtag make room for Oak. And all the publicity that Great Comet had wanted all this time has finally come. And it's terrible publicity. Mandy Patinkin then backed out because he did not understand, like, hey, you did not tell me that I was kicking someone else out for this. This is not what actors do, understandably. And then Dave Malloy had to step in, and the show closed a little over a month later. This is the death knell for that show, and is the reason why Jess did not get to see the show in October <laughs> like he was originally supposed to. <laughs> oh. Oh. Jess, yeah. would you have cared if you saw that famous actor playing? No! <laughs> <laughs> about that casting okay like pierre is not an old person and i'm sorry manny patinkin maybe this were 1984 but i'm just like you know putting up someone who's pushing 70 you know against a character that's basically a young woman ingenue it's just like ugh, some shit i get why they went for manny patinkin but i'm like ugh. i, I'm I thought just... pierre was supposed to be old yeah no, Pierre's he's older kind of, he's an old soul basically yeah i mean in the book Doesn't, so, i feel like he says that he is old i, I thought I mean, he was like an old person uh there's like a line like uh like they like he's very fondly referred to as older but like in the book he's 26 at the at that point and gotcha. natasha's like 18 so yeah he's like an old well, josh Groban does not look 26 no he does not josh Groban <laughs> looks like he's hit a hard 50 in that show uh um, yeah that's about how old i thought he was yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, and it is, uh, yeah, it's like there's there's uh, some such of a line in, like, his opening number, Pierre, that it's just like, uh, our most dear, most, there, there's something that calls him old, but he's not, he's not actually old. He's just kind of an old sad soul at that point in War and Peace. Everyone goes through, like, eight million character changes in War and Peace. <laughs> it's a long book. It's set it over, is, like, 20 it years. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just getting, like, a very small slice of it, but, uh, yeah. No, and like Mandy Patinkin versus like someone who's playing an you know an eighteen year old ingenue is just like, Ugh! Ugh! Ugh. was it worth killing the show over it though? Well, the oh. show was dying anyways, as Dave Malloy yeah. later said. Like the show, we're not making money. We had to get someone big in there, or else we were gonna close anyway. I'll just say it raised some very um, important issues with uh, Broadway casting, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it it does. And both sides made good points, and I don't think either was ill-intentioned. I no, think a yeah. lot of mistakes were made, though. Yeah, a lot of mistakes were made, and I'm, I'm very, unfortunately, a fantastic show had to close before Jess could see it. Yeah, that, that, tragic, <laughs> tragic. No yeah. one ever thought about asking me how I felt about a situation. <laughs> yeah. They were all in a boardroom saying, like, well, Jess hasn't seen it, and they're like, I know, the bottom fuck line. Em. And they're like, yeah, fuck them. I'm so they sorry. had XX Jess World loaded up on their computer, and they're like, "This guy hasn't seen it yet." Uh, yeah, who cares? <laughs> there is one comment I would want to make about the Mandy Patinkin thing before we never bring it up ever again. I regret every day that I will never hear his version of Dust and Ashes. Yeah, I just in my head it just sounds all like finishing the hat. <laughs> He he would do it in very high. He's be like, "Is yeah. this how I die?" Yeah. Yeah. In this Mandy Patinkin <laughs> way. Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> yeah. It's like he was in the room with us. He's like, "And I'm so ready. <laughs> wake up now. I want oh, to I'm wake ready. up. I'm ready." <laughs> Love it. Oh, we we missed out, kids. All right, let's talk about let's chill. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese to get started today. 
Today, I am suggesting a very light read. It's going to be a really easy book. It's War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> <laughs> it is narrated by Frederick Davidson. You can just get this out in the afternoon. It's a real easy read for, like, your so young. This is one of those young adult novels, right? Like Harry Potter? Yeah, it's just like adult and I start. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese for your free audiobook. All right, folks, let's get back to the real show. Let's talk about the prologue, because this is like one of the most incredible opening numbers of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Angelina, tell me what it's like to see it on stage and just your thoughts on that opening number. Um, so, yeah, going going and not knowing anything about it, um, but also being a fan of War and Peace, uh, like when you kind of catch on to what the conceit of the song is. And you're kind of like, this is fantastic, because it's literally just like, hey, you dumb dumbs, we know you haven't read War and Peace we're going to make this real easy for you so we can get to the fun stuff, which I really appreciate. I love that in any piece of media where they're like, let's get the hard stuff out of the way and get to what's really interesting about the characters. But basically they're just going down. It's like a 12 days of Christmas of angry Russian nobles, essentially where uh, everyone's kind of introduced and given like one real defining character trait about them. And that's kind of like your handy pokey decks of navigating war and peace. Exactly. And they also give you a Pokedex, a literal Pokedex in the (laughs) audience, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, number one, Pierre, he's a psychic type. Ooh. <laughs> and if you actually look at Dave Malloy's like Spotify, he has like a list of song inspirations for each song within the show. And like 12 Days of Christmas is definitely among many other songs in here. <laughs> and in the very, very early productions of this, the song did not exist. And they just started with the song Pierre. I cannot imagine. Then- <laughs> Rachel oh, Shafkin no. basically said no one understands what's going on in this show so write something that explains something so he's like alright shitheads here's what we got just spelling it out for you being one of the dum dums, I do appreciate it but it wasn't enough <laughs> <laughs> you were too much of a dum dum. <laughs> I'm too dum dum. <laughs> oh we accounted for dum dum, but not too dum dum. oh no <laughs> Take the tempo down a little bit, and maybe I'll understand. <laughs> Can we play this in slow motion? <laughs> but not only does it, like, tell, like, each character, it also sets up the tone perfectly. Like, yeah, we're gonna break the fourth wall, we might talk to you, we might interact with you, it's gonna be big, it's gonna be bombastic, get ready, folks! I think it's like that the opening of Cats if it weren't people dressed in uh, leotards, and uh, you didn't have to understand what a fucking jellical cat was. But rather, uh, you know. Well, you can't understand what a Jellico cat is. It doesn't exist. <laughs> as far as I'm aware. <laughs> oh, oh, how dare you! Know. <laughs> Sir, you are talking to a Jellico right now. We're all Jellico Russians. We're all Jellico <laughs> Russians. <laughs> because Russians can can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Natasha, are you going to go to the Jellico ball? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Great Comet ends with Natasha getting on the comet as it rises up from the stage. Just like an end. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, when the day's hustle and bustle is done, Anatole's work has just begun. <laughs> <laughs> so this show is just, now that you put it that way, it all makes sense. It's just cats. Yeah, it's just cats. <laughs> it's a bunch I think of Russian Malloy would actively get mad at us for saying it's just cats. It's just cats, but with Russians. Yeah, it's a cat set in Russia in, you know, 1812. That's a plot. Yeah, that's a plot. (laughs) You know what Tolstoy was like, I really like the show Cats, how can I make this into my own thing? And then he went a little bit revisionist with it, just a little bit. Mm. A little bit. He's like, oh, Cats is an IP now, because, you know, really useful group trademarks, everything. I'm just going to, like, do a fine replace of Monkestrap's name with Pierre. And uh, we're good. Anatole is just Rum Tum Tugger. (laughs) You're right. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Ah! Natasha does have, like, a Grizabella fall from grace. 
Yeah, oh she does. Oh my god, it? it's just cats, guys. Oh, is it a cats War prequel? War and Peace. Oh. War and Peace is just cats. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, Balaga is Skimbleshanks the Railway Cat. Oh my goodness. Oh, it all lines up. If this were oh my goodness. if this were a video, you'd have to cut to that shot from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia of like the a cork board with like all the connecting files and like <laughs> It's just cats, guys. It's just cats. It's just cats. Damn it, <laughs> we figured it out. Tell us right now and we won't tell anyone else. Give us some money and we won't reveal your secrets. I was reading this book, War and Peace. It's just cats. Oh, it's just cats. All of it. <laughs> you pull off like Dave Malloy's face and it's actually old Deuteronomy and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> okay, I like the prologue. It's very, it's a very fun song and I like that they try to explain it because they realize that the show is really fucking confusing. Yeah. Um, I just wish that I had the little, the little Pokedex card that explains everything else to me when I'm in the show. Because once, once you get through like four different songs, I forget everything they said in the prologue, and it's oh no, <laughs> oh, oh no, oh, oh no no. There's there's a Maria and a Mary. They, <sighs> I remember who the crazy guy was, but we're past the crazy guy, oh, yeah. and now it's now I'm lost. Oh. <laughs> oh. But Andre is also Andre's father. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's also uh not only is great comet uh cats but it's also psycho where uh yeah it turns out that he is his mother um and it's killed everyone you empty and stupid to fellows satisfied with your place i'm different from you i'm different from you i stand I pity you, I pity me, I pity you. I pity you, I pity me, I pity you. All right, let's move on to Pierre. <laughs> oh. Pierre is like that song. It's like the poem or like the live journal entry you write when you're like a junior <laughs> and you're convinced of your own brilliance. And you're like, oh, I pity those sheeple that are listening to Britney Spears. I listen to Avril Lavigne. <sighs> yeah. yeah. So I relatable. mean, he basically says that when he says, I'm staring at my screen, which is a real anachronism, but it somehow fits. It works somehow. When I first saw it, I thought he said hours at my screed, which also works. But I, I, I like the hours at my screen. I like to think that like um, Pierre's um, like a time traveler who has seen it all. He has seen the horrors of Twitter and has come back to 18th, 19th century Russia because, wow. We used to be better. We used to be better. We used to be better. <laughs> well, we were never better. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, it's like this, like great, like wood, like I, I, I'm talking like I have a music theory background when I don't, but it's like what an E minor, and it's just angsty, and it's a, it's an E double sharp, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with some EDM thrown yeah. in. Yeah, it's got yeah. a nice cho chocolatey overnote to it. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I love that song because it kind of like there's the show itself is so bonkers that like Pierre's narrative really is kind of what grounds it. And gives it a bit more of a philosophical bent. So I, I love this number. And uh, I love how it kind of gets inverted musically at the end of the show. But we'll get to that later. Um, I think this is a great I want song without ever saying I want. He has very vague ideas of what he really needs. And it sets him up strangely as our main character as opposed to Natasha. And I'm going to talk about musical theater structure, where the opening number is just like setting up the world. The second number should always be your I want song, or at least there are exceptions that prove the rule. But more or less, that is how it works. Um, and Natasha doesn't have her I want song for another four songs. <laughs> Crazy to me that they are decidedly saying, Pierre is the main character, folks. Yeah. Even though you don't see... Well, he's, a, he's a more interesting main character, I think. Uh, I think she deals with more. I 100% think that it's her story, but... Does deal with more, but Pierre is more interesting. He's a more interesting person. His arc is more interesting. I, hmm, so, so this is like a, this is like a late night, uh, five bottles of wine kind of conversation here. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, 
about like internal versus external characters and like what you kind of gravitate to. And Natasha's a very, especially at this point in the show, a very external person. A lot of her um, kind of internal growth happens after this point, like after where great comic cuts off. So you're kind of, you are kind of like flying blind into like, what the fuck is this girl doing? Um, there's also like a lot of missing context about Andre in the show that I think if I had one nitpicky criticism, I would have added in, which is like Andre's kind of trying to avoid committing. Um, and Natasha is young and kind of gets that vibe, but can't really put it, uh, uh, you know, I like couldn't put a name to that vibe, you know? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. But like it, it, Natasha's definitely like the external character appears kind of a lot more philosophical in nature. And so I kind of get it. Like philosophically, the show kind of lies with him. In film school, they taught me the difference between a plot and story. And I think the Natasha and Pierre represent both in different ways. Natasha represents plot, meaning things happen to her. Whereas Pierre represents story, where he is the thematic arc of the tale. <laughs> that is where I think the difference is, where we think that Pierre is more introspective and emotional, where Natasha, in the original production with Philippa Sue, um, I feel like she doesn't have much agency because of how kind of wide-eyed and doe I the way that Philippa Sue played it, which yeah. is quite like the book. But I think that Danae Benton really adds this like kind intelligence to her to the character that wasn't there previously that makes me find her more interesting in all honesty. Oh, the snow. Let's talk about no one else. <laughs> Nobody else but you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Angelina, you love this song. You know, I, I had the opening number happen, and I was like, holy shit, I love this. And then no one else happened. And for me, it was just one of the most, you know, you get all these ingenue songs in the beginning of first acts, and usually they're just like pretty straightforward, hopeful, but there's like just such a hint of sadness and of, what's to come in that number and just uh like i oh it just killed me um i sang that song to my daughter every day while i was pregnant with her and it's just like oh it's it's one of my i i you yeah but it, yeah i just love how the foreshadowing of like things will not be as natasha expects and even after the show like uh, she'll never be that happy again there's this line like i'll never be this happy again as she sings about principal konsky who she's engaged to and you know, things she's so in love with. And yeah, yeah, she even says at that point, like, I'll never be this happy again. And it, to me, that is just like such a, uh, it hurts my heart. It hurts my heart. Yeah, I'm with you all the way. And this is the first time, like, you can really see how good Dave Malloy is at translating, like, written text to, like, song and making it sing. Um, like, the first time I heard your voice, Moonlight Burst in the Room, is basically taken from Tolstoy directly. And the quote was, Moonlight as if it has been watching at the window a long time, waiting for that burst into the room. Like, that, that's such a brilliant way to take the truth and make it rhyme, as, like, yeah. a lot of people try to make it say. Yeah, like, there's, uh, I think it's, like, worth noting that, like, most of Great Comet is, if not verbatim, pretty directly taken from Tolstoy's writing. And I think... I love that Dave Malloy trusts in how good Tolstoy's writing is and uses his music to just kind of like bring it to like this next level that only like musical theater could really do. Um, like with the finale of the show, it's just, I could gush forever about how much Dave Malloy lets the text lead, but also adds, you know, who Dave Malloy is musically to it. And it's just, <sighs> I'm like having a nosebleed right now. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> 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 Andrew, what did you think of this song? No one else? Yeah. Um, this is uh, the number where you actually get to know who Natasha is, which is nice. Since she, she was in two other songs before this. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I I like it. it it's, I I think I as a song setting up a character, I I think I like Pierre better, but <laughs> that's me, I guess. I don't know. Well, well, this sets up her story a lot better. Like it sets up the plot and her introspective beliefs because it shows yes. like her, her deep emotional connection to Andre, and it sets up a lot of th- themes, um, like yes. musical themes that we're gonna see later. Um, yes, it's very good. It's a gorgeous song, and the staging of it is just incredible. Yeah. Like, the flashbacks to Andre and the use oh, of snow, the spotlights. Yeah. Oh, my God, it hurts my heart to watch. Like, Are, it's so gorgeous. Man, I down? wish I got to see that stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah, that it's, like, just so cinematic and wonderful. Like, Rachel, this is where, like, that moment where I was like, Rachel Shopkin is God, because, oh, that moment where she just sees Andre, you know, miles away with the snow coming down. I bet you it's better live than it was in my <laughs> crappy recording. Oh, you mean like some guy named Dave from Idaho recording it on his iPhone didn't give you the full yeah. experience? <laughs> so, like, a lot of my experience with this show is is just purely from the music yeah. alone, yeah. listening to the cast recordings. So this one's not... It didn't really stand out that much to me as far as just music. Sure. So It was good. I don't, I don't think there's any song in the show I didn't like. Uh, mm-hmm. But, yeah, this one was good, though. Can I just comment on Danae Benton's performance of this, where she... I I don't like when just girls that know how to belt just belt an entire song. Yeah. She chooses the quiet moments so intelligently. Yeah. Like, when she turns to just, like, and nobody knows just you and me, it's our secret. She, like, says that so quietly and then turns to a member of an audience and they just beam at her with that same, like, bursting smile that yeah. I would have if I was in that audience. Yeah, like, I was just smiling that whole number. But also sad and and having a nosebleed again. (laughs) And it has like very thoughtful, like the ending of it is not concrete in any way. It's just like he's um, maybe he'll come today. Maybe he came already and he's sitting in the drawing room and I simply forgot. Yeah, that feels childlike, but not unintelligent. Yeah, I mean, that's that's also Tolstoy's writing again. And I love again that Dave Mm -hmm. trusts in the text so much. And it's beautiful, beautiful. (laughs) They say we are asleep. Until we fall in love, we are children of dust and ashes. But when we fall in love, we wake up and we are a God and angels. We, but if I die here tonight, I die. Let's move to Dust and Ashes. Oh, oh, I turned to a grandma at this song. Like, I'm just like, oh, isn't that sweet? Oh, oh, my God. I think I like I like the idea of the song the best as far as like lyric quality and uh, what, what the song's about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I find it funny because this was the last song written for the show. Right. Like in the original original album, this song did not exist. It was written especially for Josh Groban. Yeah, and that as someone who didn't come to the show until the Broadway version, that kind of blows my mind. Like Dust and Ashes feels so central to necessary. Yeah, driving the show. Um, that no offense, I can't see. I'm sure Great Comet was incredible of an experience off Broadway, but it's, I can't imagine the show without that song. So what would even happen? You just have the duel, and then it just. That's it? Yep. They just move on to the next scene, which I believe was just Natasha waking up the next morning. That would have just been so lame. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like, oh, well, here's a duel. You failed. Um, now let's go to Natasha's bedroom where she just wants to go shopping. Yeah. That's the obvious conclusion yeah. of yeah. that scene. <laughs> you know i'm not gonna lie it's baffling because i fell in love with the show before this song existed and quite often when new things are added to a show that you already love you're not a big fan of it but this is like okay that's in come on bring it in bring it in with the rest of it it works is, yeah i yeah yeah like i always have to wonder what it was like you know hearing that song for the first time is like 
um, someone who loved the show? Is it like back in like 2004 when I have to listen to uh, No One Would Listen, which was written for fans? <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I imagine, you mean the classic Gerard <laughs> Butler bop? <laughs> yes, just uh, you know, it's a sad Saturday night. I'm gonna put on No One Would Listen uh, and uh, cry my uh, sorrows away. Yeah, I, I imagine that listening to Dust and Ashes um, as a fan of Great Comet before the Broadway run was the same experience as listening to No One Would Listen uh, right before the 2004 Phantom came out. Same exact experience. Um, but yeah, that was a, oh my gosh, it, you know, it's a goosebumps moment on the cast recording, but when you see that like live in person, when it gets to that acapella moment towards the end where the music cuts out, it is just like, so like I had mentioned that I had seen the show after a really bad time in my life. And the one of that big line is like, I- I'm so ready to wake up now. And it just, oh, when the tempo picks up, it, I remember being like, oh fuck, I've been read for filth. This show has seen me. Um, and also Josh Groban singing in a fat suit. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the takeaway. Uh, uh, but yeah, um, just such an incredible song. Um, one of those things that I'm mad that most karaoke places, m- most, by most, I mean all karaoke places don't have it. Because <laughs> everyone would listen to me. I would do great karaoke of this very, very drunk. Yeah. I am sorry. I wake oh, up, now. Wake up I'm now. sorry. I wake up now. <laughs> I don't deserve life for that. <laughs> um, but I love how there's like three sections to this song. Like, it's like a mini story in its own. Like, there's multiple realizations within it, and the music reflects that. It's just such a such a wild song because i remember as i was sitting in the theater watching it being like okay this is like the josh groban ballad and it kind of starts out that way and then it like slides into like this great klezmer kind of feel that changes like oh so good yeah i love it anyway i I keep saying that but you you get my vibe We talk about Sonia alone. <gasps> uh, um, so good. Uh, it's like that. We, oh, Sonia's like one of my favorite characters in War and Peace, and I, I, there's like such a great pathos to her because she's the character that just like never gets what she wants in throughout the book. Like, gets nothing and is just selfless for 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 better or worse. You know, never to her betterment. So. To me, like, it's, like, such a good devotion song to a friend when you know that they're going to fuck up really badly. Like, when your friend's like, yeah, I'm going to get, like, a dick tattooed on my arm because I'm really drunk. You're like, no, don't do that. Oh, don't do that. Uh, Sonia alone is that I think it's the female equivalent of Michael in the Bathroom for Be More Chill oh, and a much better version yeah. of that song I, in all honesty. Yeah. It's a platonic friend song. It, it, I mean, it's it's the same It's the same exact, like, yeah. sentiment. I, I love it, like. Um, I, I also, a lot of it's just kind of, um, um, uh, Britain, Britain Ashford, just like kind of, you know, very, um, particular voice. Like, Specific. I will present your name in your heart. It's just like, it sounds like I'm mocking her, but it's just, it's so singular and wonderful that like, I, I don't, I never saw, um, Ingrid Nicholson in the role. Yeah. But to me, that's like. She sounds very much like she's doing a uh, Britain Ashford impression. Oh if, and it's weird. Yeah. I think it's like almost written in a way like somehow like Jean Valjean and Les Mis. Everyone's- Every Jean Valjean is doing a Colm Wilkinson impression yeah. somehow. I'm reaching but I fall and the night is clo- Yeah, like 
You can never <laughs> yeah. not have a little bit of Colm Wilkinson in a role. You can never not have a little bit of Britton Ashford in Sonya alone. Um, love it though. So good. Of course, I, I do love it. I want to sing this one day, just just because it's like little. It would be very easy for me to sing without trouble. Today's that day, Jess. I, I think it earnestly has like the most. Like, <laughs> do it now. <laughs> Nothing, you vile, shameless girl. In my house, in my house, a nice girl, very nice. You dirty, nasty wench of a thing. Now don't you say one word. In my house, in my house, horrid girl, hussy. It's lucky for him he escaped, but I'll find him. Now you listen to me when I speak to you. Now you listen to me when I speak to you. In my house, in my house, do you hear what I'm saying or not? We have to talk about In My House, and I'm just lumping that together with a call to Pierre, because they are continuations yeah. of each other, more or less. Um, Maria Dmitrievna uh, shoves your tongue up your ass, yeah. basically. Grace McLean. It's like the ultimate, like, if you were a bitter alto in high school who never got, like, a role in shows, I don't speak from experience or anything like that. Um, this <laughs> song is just kind of like a convergence of everything you would ever want in, like, a, a mezzo. Like Karen Jarrett, just like ah, ah, in my house, in my house, and it's just like it's screamy, it's shouty. Again, the other song in the show where I'm like, how the fuck did Dear Evan Hansen win Best Orchestrations over this? Um, there's so much wild shit going on in it. Uh, same with the call to Pierre. It's just like they slap, mm -hmm. as the kids say. Mm -hmm. And a call to Pierre was originally going to be a lot more old fashioned and slow, but then they're like. This is boring. Just make it sound cool and weird. I love that. There's like a great, like, kind of like almost operatic, but almost knowingly silly, like, what series of what's in that song? Where, like, yeah. What? Like, what? Maria's like listing all of the bad things that Natasha's gotten up to, and Pierre just like keeps reacting with bigger and bigger disbelief, like, what? It is so corny, but knows that it is. And it's just like, oh, fucking pour it on my face. I love it. Um, Andrew, what did you think of these songs? In my house, I really liked A Call to Pierre, the what thing is funny, as you guys said. I mean, I think I think you guys are covering it pretty fucking well. <laughs> I, in my, I will say in my house, the yelling part is awesome. <laughs> which is like the whole thing, but... She gets like total mom voice and that, which is like, now you listen to me when I speak to you. And I'm like, oh fuck, what did I do? Uh, just listening to it. It's the way she goes from like a whisper to a scream, like throughout it. It's like very calm but very tense, and like you are your body is on the wall, leaving an imprint like Wiley e. Coyote because she's screaming so <laughs> like, loud. Mom, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that crowns were hard to get off the wall. I'm so sorry, Mom. Uh, I uh, the, the, the Cole Pierre has my favorite like I'm in a car singing this to myself line in it, and it's uh, four and a toy is a married man, you know, it's just. I wish I could hear Colm Wilkinson sing that, or Manny Patinkin, for that matter. Because Anatole is a married man! <laughs> That's a really good Manny Patinkin. But, uh, yeah. The one line I say, like, naturally, just to, like, my friends now without context is, like, and all will be ruined. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, all will be ruined, guys. Uh, love it. And just, like, go go and listen to the cello on that. On those two songs and, and the woodwinds. Please, just on listen it. to this yeah, fucking just musical. To fucking what the fuck are you doing? Why are you go listen to that? I also like that Pierre is finally brought yeah. into the story again. <laughs> finally, <laughs> but he's on stage the yeah. entire time. <laughs> yeah, he's just actually yeah. does something now. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well be playing on his phone yeah. the entire time, but yeah. he's there. He, this, he is so <laughs> good, crush man. Uh, Pierre feels like the easiest role on Broadway. Oh I'd yeah, love you that. just sit. And sing really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Dave Malloy played him, like, for most of the run. And he is a lot of things, but a fantastic singer is not particularly he's, one of he's them. His own yeah, but Josh Groban. <laughs> we all can't tell the indulgent friends of Josh Groban. Don't speak to me like that. I am not worth it. 
Stop, stop, stop. You have your whole life before you. Before me. You know all is over for me. All over. If, if I were not myself, but the brightest, handsomest, best man on earth, and if I were free, I would get down on my knees this minute and ask you for your hand and for your love. Let's talk about Pierre and Natasha. <laughs> so good. Um, again. Okay. Um, I loved Pierre and Natasha because it's basically just the same piano riff throughout yeah. the entire thing. It's it's really like um a, an actor song because it's the same piano riff and it's just straight up. It it is literally straight up the dialogue and the describing action from War and Peace and it, all of that really just rests in the heart of the performers and the two, the chemistry that these two people have with each other when they haven't interacted with each other the entire show. Um, I saw it with Josh Groban and Danae Benton and I saw it with Dave Malloy and Danae Benton and both times or all three times I saw it, it just, oh, you, you could, you could hear a pin drop in the theater throughout the entire thing. So it's, which is really impressive because it's a quiet song. It's just the same, you know, riff repeating over and over again. But like, I didn't breathe every single time I saw it. Um, and so it's just like, you know, Natasha's basically hit like her lowest point. She's, you know, had a failed suicide attempt and has disgraced herself. And Andre goes up to his bro, Pierre, and is like, yo, go tell Natasha off, bro. And Pierre's like, sure. And then he gets there and it's just, overwhelmed with so much feeling for Natasha that, you know, he can't be a dick to her. And it's, it's so beautiful. I. And it has one line that makes me want to sob my eyes out every time I hear it. I think Dave Malloy delivers this a little better than Josh Groban, but I think you know what I'm talking about. It's himself. if I were not myself, but the brightest, handsomest, best man on earth. And if I were free, I would get down on one knee this minute and ask you for your hand and for oh. your love. And Yeah, it's the only talking in the show. It's, it's the only actually spoken dialogue. It's a moment of silence. Yeah. It's the only silence yeah. in the show, basically. And again, like just like the energy in the room at that point is just so it's it's everything you've just even without having seen these two characters interact together, you're like, this feels right. Like it's it's kind of like miraculous that you pull that off, you know, with two characters who haven't spoken to each other, and yet you buy this intense surge of emotion and love and empathy. I oh, I don't have anything really funny to say about this besides um on the way home, uh, after I saw it, I had had multiple servings of uh, wine the first time, and I went on a bus immediately afterwards and downloaded the cast recording and just listened to it and cried the whole way home. So I feel really sorry. For the forty-five-year-old man that was sitting next to me, um, for that door bus ride, he's all over for me. Uh, yeah, um, but so good. Um, <laughs> There's a war going on out there it's somewhere. In my heart, it's in me. The war was in me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> the war was the friends we made along the, the way. The war was the peace we made along the way. Very true. Um, but just so good. Um, I I know I keep saying that, but really, it's a fucking great show. I I don't have anything really terribly funny to say about this number. It's just incredibly. It seems to me that this comet. Me feels my softened and uplifted soul, and my newly melted heart now blossoming. To a 
Okay, let's move to a hilarious number, The Great Comet of 1812. Andrew, I'm gonna let you start with this one. This is a really good song, I love it. <laughs> I don't really have much to say, everything's so fucking good. Um, the way that they end it with the title of the show, uh... Wow. In, in, oof, it's just fucking... Just fucking listen to it. What the hell are you listening to me for? Like, Christ <laughs> almighty. Well, it was <laughs> Comet of 1812. Damn it. Um, it doesn't. If you're listening it's to really any good. song that will get you into yeah. it, I recommend Actually, this, this one. Actually, this is the song that I, I give to people when I'm like, hey, you want to hear a song from the show? That's great. Um, it, it's. Mm. And I, I love this song because it. I like that the show feels, you know, empowered to end on an immensely quiet internal note as opposed to be like big finale of the show it's instead like this very quiet but powerful emotional catharsis and it's just like the lights get dimmer and it's just you know josh groban emoting to the void <laughs> but it works really well um i couldn't like see through my tears the first time i saw it i was like oh fuck i'm crying it does have one of my favorite jokes in the whole show where you know pierce just left natasha's house and he can't put on his coat uh you can't find the sleeves the sleeves yeah and you're like it like that line always got like the biggest laugh one of the biggest laughs because it's just like one intense moment that needed like kind of like the pressure to be let off and then it goes right into another like oh my god existential moment and you're like well fuck me. um but yeah i love this number i listen to this mm -hmm. number all the time it's so do i um, I can't ever skip it if it comes up on my shuffle. And it begins with a D major chord, which is the same yeah, chord that yeah. starts Pierre, tying his story to yeah. the beginning and the end. Oh. Wow. And it's so wonderful and quiet. I remember when that show ended and the lights went down, the, the Josh Groban mom behind me was like, is that it? And I was like... <sighs> um, is that it? Was that the end? <laughs> <laughs> Where was the dancing yeah. girls? Uh, where the <laughs> Where's all the girls? Where, where, where was? <laughs> I was looking for elephants. Where were the elephants? <laughs> yes. Okay, Thirsty, <Cersei>, shut <laughs> up. Uh, I was told there was going to be a comet in the show. I got a chandelier. There was no ten-year-old girl singing to a dog, which is how I judge every Broadway show that I see. So it wasn't Annie, and uh, was that it? Um, yeah. The logo of it looks kind of like the Muppet show, though. Okay, I... Oh, yeah, okay, so if... if Okay, so Great Comet isn't just cats, but it's also the Muppet okay, show. Okay, so if this was a Muppet version, if Josh Groban would be Pierre, who would be Natasha? Uh, Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy, Miss Piggy, and Andre would be Kermit? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we all know that Anatole would be Kermit. <laughs> No, that's not okay. No, be only because I now I must go off to <laughs> Petersburg. <laughs> Look, all I know is that Balaga is sweet, all right. and if you got a problem with that, you can step the fuck off. <laughs> da 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 da. da, da. <laughs> and Bolkonski yeah. is animal. Yeah. Bolkonski is animal. <laughs> I can see this uh, working. It's time to watch the comic. All right, guys, the Great Muppet Show of eighteen twelve. <laughs> I think this should be a new recurring segment on our show. How would we Muppetize this musical? I, it seems as though it already is. <laughs> it's time to make the war now. It's time to find some people. Guys, it's time to do some trivia. All right, we'll do we'll do a one v one. Whoever whoever fucking answers the right the question right wins. Okay. And if you both answer it right, then we'll do oh. a then we'll do a bonus okay. round. Okay, that sounds oh. good. Okay, so first question: the consistent understudy for Pierre throughout every oh. run of the show's life. I, can I go? Or uh, is it Scott Stangbert? I'd give I it think, to her. I'll give. I her think you said. I think you said Stangbert, which is fine. <laughs> I'll give it to her. She knew the answer. That's his twin. That's his. That's his twin. It's fine. She knew. Okay. I was gonna say, if you ask good. him if that's the correct answer, I think he feels <laughs> differently. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, Jess, here's the question. Okay. To, to play the role of Pierre, Josh Graban actually had to learn the accordion. 
which he did not know before. What was the very common Russian name of the accordion he took with him to practice on while on his concert tour? Um, I don't know. I, I know I've watched it where he said I named her something and I don't remember it. Ah, Jess, Jess, that's so that's so sad. You're giving up your, your crown here. I am. But uh, I am. the name is uh, Olga? Yes. Olga. 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 Well, Angelina now owns this podcast and I am resigning. I hope everyone likes 30 hours of me <laughs> talking about cats. They do. Yeah, they really do. <laughs> it's, it's, a it's a curious cat. Uh, <laughs> oh. It's true, he is. That's his only characteristic. Well, he also That's the only characteristic he has. He's a cur he is a curious cat. Well, he will do do as he do do's, which is the, my favorite line in any show ever. You know who else do do's as he do do's? Audible. <laughs> uh, today's show is brought to you by Audible. Kill yourself, Jess. Audible is offering our listeners <laughs> a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. Well, that was a lot of fun, you guys. I'm going to let you guys talk about your overall thoughts on Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 and your cheese ratings. I'll go first because I have probably uh, not as much to say. <laughs> Sadly, I didn't get to see this show three times live. Um... So I don't have as strong of an opinion about it. <laughs> um, I think the music in it is absolutely fantastic and super original. And I don't usually say original as a compliment, but with this, I've never really heard anything like it. Um, so, yeah. It's great. <laughs> uh, the story is a little hard to follow, but it doesn't really matter that much because the music is so good that you could just kind of listen to it anyways. Um, and then as far as a cheese rating goes, I am probably just going to give it a Russian cheese of some kind. So I will go with whatever Jess goes with, because I'm sure he has a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 is a musical I hold very dear to my heart. I love it so much. Um, I will never turn down a chance to listen to that album because... It is a ride from beginning to end. There is not a single dull moment in it. There's not one thing I would change about it. It is the definition of a perfect thing. And I am very glad it exists. I am sad I never got to see it live, despite me almost getting two. Thanks, Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> but it is incredible, and everyone involved is so far, like, we've interacted with them. They're all genuinely wonderful human beings, too. So that also makes me very happy. Um... I will give this a uh, Tilsit cheese, which is from the Russia. Um, self stick. As I said, guys, he, great pick, Jess. That's what I'm going with as well. All right. <laughs> Angelina, give us your overall thoughts and your um, cheese rating. I think Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 is one of the most innovative, passion driven pieces of, of, of art to have hit Broadway in, in the last 20 years. Um, not only as an original work is it incredible, but it's also a wonderful example of how adaptation doesn't have to be like, you know, Shrek the musical, uh, where it's hyper literal and just doing it for the sake of doing it. It is an adaption made of love. Um, the music is unlike anything else I've ever heard. Everyone involved with it is just, uh, just magical and talented. It's literally a show that is uh, kind of defined my 30s for me. Um, please go listen to it. Just do yourself a favor. Even if it's confusing, you'll be happy and confused. Um, my cheese rating is some sort of a Roquefort or Stilton. You know, it's a little funky and weird. It's not the kind of thing I think that most people would originally go out for on a cheese plate, but it grows on you, and once you have experienced it, nothing else really tastes the same. Angelina, I know you do a lot <laughs> of things, but I want you to shill it out there for the world so everyone can find you, because oh, you're you. incredible. You guys are incredible. I had so much fun. Um, so I am, uh, as we as we I'm mentioned so earlier, I'm co-writer and co-editor for Lindsay Ellis. Uh, we will be having a video on uh, Game of Thrones coming out uh, this week, so if you just Google Lindsay Ellis, you'll get her YouTube channel and you'll see it. Um, I also do improv musical comedy at Philadelphia Improv Theater with the musical team Thank You Places. We do an hour-long musical made up on the spot. It's every Saturday night at 8 p.m. and it kicks ass uh that's all i got quick think of a musical right now that is about russia but not great this comic is cats in right russia. now on the spot. this is cats in russia we don't fly up on a tiger <laughs> we fly up on a you go 
yeah, there you go. Uh, that, that's all I got. We're all Russian yeah. cats. We're all Russian <laughs> cats. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. This was a great show. We hope you guys will keep listening. Since we know you have your phone in your hand right now, why don't you just hop onto iTunes and just give us a review? Give us five stars. Tell us how awesome we are or tell us how terrible we are. Just straight into it. Just, just, just tell us. Um, also, find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and all other podcast formats, including iHeartRadio, which is a weird one, at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. Give us some money on Patreon. Uh, Musicals with Cheese. We're going to have a bunch of commentaries this summer. Um, there are allowed to vote on what they want to commentary on. I saw that there's already a bunch of votes in. So come on, give us some money and you can be a part of the creation. We're going to be doing some more live streams. Some of them are patron only. Some of them you can join in. But you want to be in the patron only one. Um, we're on Instagram at Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page is also Musicals with Cheese. Send us an email at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. We've been loosening up on the emails. Come on, come on, tell us what you think, folks. Our title card was created by the amazing Jolene Casco. Her Instagram is at Jolene Casco. Andrew, t- plug your album. Oh, yes. Uh, my band, Thanks, with an exclamation point, is now on like pretty much everything with a full EP of seven songs. Give us a listen if you want to. I don't sing, thank you. I'm on bass. <laughs> it's pretty neat. I like it a lot. All right. Do you guys have anything else you want to say before we wrap it on up? Great comment was robbed there. Yeah, I would agree, considering now now that I've listened to it and I've also listened to Dear Evan Hansen, absolutely it was robbed. <laughs> um, I'm going to say fuck you, Manny Pachinko. And all right, we'll Aww. see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. <laughs>